Welcome to Build, I'm Sam Thompson and we are live from London. Now today we are joined by a very special guest. Please put your hands together for Simon Callow, CBE. He is here to talk about once again taking to the stage as Ebenezer Scrooge in A Christmas Carol. Now if anyone has any questions for Simon, please feel free to tweet us at Build Series LDN or if you're watching this on Facebook Live, just leave a comment below. Simon, how are you today? Marvellous. <laughs> you look very so chic, it's frightening. I do. <laughs> you very much do. It's the waistcoat, isn't it? <laughs> I, I, think, I actually think yeah. it is. Now, Simon, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention some of your amazing past works. You have starred in so much, not to mention Shakespeare in Love, Four Weddings and a Funeral, which I loved, Victoria and Abdul, and one of my all-time favourites as well, Ace Ventura. Ah. <laughs> One yes. Of the high yes. points of my career. <laughs> now you are taking the stage once more, though, as Ebenezer Scrooge. Well, actually, as thirty-seven characters. Oh my God! Because it's a one-man show, a one-man version of the uh, um, great story. Uh, I play everybody, um, and uh, you should see me dancing the Fezziwigs Ball. <laughs> All on my own. That's quite something. <laughs> but uh, yes, I, uh, it's, uh, it's the fifth year in which I've done this. And it's uh, one of the most exciting things I ever get to do. Because it's a story that really, really bites with people. They really get it. And it's not anything to do with turkeys and, 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 and uh, Christmas carols. It's actually to do with the story of that guy. Ebenezer Scrooge, who's given a last chance to face himself and uh, join society again and become a, a human being instead of a, a money-making machine. And, it, and it's not just a play, though. There's a film adaptation as well, am I right? Yeah, that's absolutely true. We, 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 we shot it as a film. Not, not, it's not a, a recording of the stage show. It's a film. We shot it in a munitions depot in the Woolwich Arsenal in the bitter, bitter, bitter dark days of January. Um, Cold, dark with, days. They were, and uh, with real rats, uh, not uh, employed by us. <laughs> <laughs> they actually live there. And, um, and oh, God, it was freezing. But, but uh, that seemed absolutely right. You know, that seemed to get us into the right place for Christmas Carol. Um, but uh, um, it is... Uh, it, it's such a moving story. I, I think that's the, the thing that's so uh, extraordinary about it is how it reaches almost everybody's heart because obviously at Christmas time, um, what Dickens said about Christmas was if we can manage to be pleasant and kind and generous throughout the year, once a, a year, we, why can't we do it all year? Yeah, yeah exactly. I completely agree. Yeah, yeah. Is this Victorian era or is this modern day? Uh, the building actually is Victorian. Uh, um, I'm modern day, sort of, and um, uh, we bridge the two, I hope, with it. I mean, uh, as you see, what I'm wearing is, is just a jacket and a tie and a pair of trousers, so there's no costume as such. But the language is Dickens's language, absolutely. And um, it is just you for 80 minutes. I know. This is the play now, on stage, okay, <laughs> with no interval. Surely, I mean, the pressure must be quite intense. It's very intense, and I do it twice a day. God help me. How do you wind down after that? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. It's not possible. I just uh, I, I go home on a wave of adrenaline. And how does not having an interval help the show? Ah, well, it's just to do with the rhythm that it creates. It's just, you know, it's all about storytelling. That's all. And uh, Dickens was one of the greatest storytellers in our language. And... I'm absolutely thrilled by the degree to which, when you just start that story with its famous first line, Marley was dead to begin with. There was no doubt whatever about that. The audience immediately wants to know who's Marley? What's, what, 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 why, why is there any question of him being dead or alive? And once the audience is hooked on the story, then a kind of a relationship between them and me starts, which you don't really want to break with an interval. You just want to go on to the end. You just want to know what's going to happen to this geezer, Ebenezer Scrooge. And why is Ebenezer Scrooge one of Dickens' best ever characters? 
Well, he's a monster, you know, and monsters are always incredibly attractive, aren't they? Richard III, whatever, you know. Uh, and uh, he's so cold, hard, bitter, uptight, hates mankind, only lives for money. And immediately, you know, you, 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 you recognize that, that figure. And then the beauty of the story are the steps by which he begins to thaw and become human again. And that is through the help of the ghosts. The ghosts, the, the three ghosts, he's haunted by three ghosts. It's, I mean, it's as if he summoned them up from inside his own soul. He knows that he's just virtually dead. And these ghosts make him confront who he was, the choices he made, how he behaved towards other people, how he behaved towards himself. And uh, it's, um, it's very upsetting, I think, sometimes. Especially there's a, there's a scene, a great scene with his girlfriend. He has a girlfriend at the beginning. And she says, we've got to part because you love something other than me. And he says, what are you talking about? And she says, you love money. That's all you love. And he says, but you can't. You know, do you want to be poor? And she says, no, but money never meant anything in our lives before. But he says, no, no. But the one thing the world will never forgive is poverty. So I'm going to make us rich. But she knows that that's a pact with the devil that he's signed, you know? And what other themes are there in this plot? Well, the, the great theme of all of Dickens, really, which is that all human beings, all of us in society, are really connected to each other. That it's a great big human pyramid, really, and everybody in the human pyramid depends on everybody else. And, and for Dickens, in, in his world, in the very heavily and in, newly industrialized world of the early Victorian period, uh, people were beginning to be ripped out of their homes, people were coming out of the countryside, coming into towns, living merely in order to, to work uh, by, with oppressive uh, bosses, their money being forced down in appalling conditions, uh, with no opportunity of pleasure or leisure. And uh, he, he saw this rift between the rich and the poor growing greater and greater. Well, if he thought that then, what would he think now? I was just about to say, I mean, in this modern day, do you almost think it's gone full circle and that we are now back to the kind of Victorian times, that huge disparity in income? Yeah. That's, that's, I, I, I mean, obviously our lives essentially are much better than the lives of the majority of people in, in his time. But nonetheless, the gap, the, the, the extraordinary sense in which uh, there's the, the most of the, the population uh, just kind of managing somehow to get by and then people who are living in conditions of unbelievable staggering indulgence and luxury for no great effort of their own, just because they know how to play the game. You know? yeah. And Scrooge, if he was a real-life character in the modern day, what job would he have? <laughs> Who would he be? Who would Scrooge be? I've always wanted to know this. Well, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, obviously. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> And um, I was always thinking as well that there are some really, like, heavy themes in this, but it's also very for children. And, and, and how, how come children get so attached to this, even though there are themes in terms of sort of, like, you know, rich oppressing the poor and stuff like that? Well, D uh, uh, Dickens is one of Dickens's greatest um, strokes of genius was always uh, to make big themes human. So... so they're never in the abstract. They're always about people who embody certain things. And uh, uh, kids, you know, as people grow up, they, they, they take different things from the, 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 the piece, either the book or, or the show. And um, what they love in this is the comedy. The kids love all the funny bits. And Dickens is always very careful to, to leaven everything with, with laughter. Uh, and satire and, and the grotesque and the hilarious. Even the ghosts 
Not the last ghost. The last ghost is just frightening. But the first two ghosts are, are, are kind of funny and, and, and uh, grand characters, weird characters. Um, uh, but but um, it's amazing that uh, children as young as six sit through it completely uh, um, compelled by it. Well, talking about children and, you know, where they, how they're growing up now, it's iPhones, it's TVs, it's constant connectivity. Yeah. And how important to you is it for the arts to remain a source of escapism? Well, I don't know that I would use the word escapism. I think I th I'm not so keen on the idea of escapism myself. I, I'm, I'm... I love it. <laughs> <laughs> we know, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but uh, uh, I don't think Dickens was very keen on uh, escapism. What, what, what he w felt that the arts could do was to nourish you, to, to, to stimulate your mind, perhaps, but also to, to, to warm you up, to, uh, to create characters that became almost part of your life. Uh, um, uh, because they reflected life as you knew it and because they were, they were gr grand characters comic or, or even tragic creations. Um, it's just filling your mental landscape up, you know. It's what, what art just means there's more in there that's, um, that you can draw from in your life. Because we all have moments when we're, when we're low or when things seem to be going very badly indeed for us or we're very hard up or whatever. And then you, you're forced back into your imagination and into your inner world. And that's what Dickens has, uh, as much as any writer in the English language, provided uh, uh, are these extraordinary images, these extraordinary, rich, full characters. Well, Dickens was also a man of the people, right? Very and, um, you know, in the West End, some tickets are now selling for, for shows, you know, all around, for like £150. Mm -hmm. How happy would he be to see that you can buy a ticket to a Christmas carol for you know, around twenty-five quid sometimes. Yeah, yeah. No, it, it, he'd, uh, he when he did his own public readings, which were the the rock concerts of their day. I mean, he played in two thousand seat auditorium. Really? Yeah, and people queued all night to see him. Uh, in Boston, uh, someone stabbed somebody else in order to get a ticket for to see Dickens. Uh, and Dickens had this very passionate belief that his work should be available to everybody. And so he said, you know, um, uh, I want working men to be able to come in for um, a shilling and everybody else would pay five shillings, let me say. And um, uh, but the trouble is that <laughs> all these clever toffs pretended to be working class people <laughs> and would put on or sort of caps and things like that, and, uh, and, and, and they, they sort of somehow conned the whole system. It was always very hard for Dickens to... He tried to arrange that, very hard indeed, to make sure that the people came. Now, that was who... That, that he felt... Dickens felt this tremendous connection to the people of Britain, and the people of Britain felt that he spoke for them. Well, he thought that democracy had failed, didn't he, all the way back then? Yeah. But, but remember that uh, part of the problem was that democracy then wasn't democracy yeah. as we know it now. Women, for example, had no vote. Lots of working people had no vote. Um, but he just felt that certainly Parliament, as it was constituted, he said, you know, I, I, my, my faith in the, uh, those who govern is absolutely minuscule. My faith in those who are governed is limitless. Uh, that was his, his belief. He was a populist, you know. Um, uh, he didn't much, he, he didn't think very highly of the way Parliament worked. And I don't think probably he'd think very much of the way Parliament works now. He thought in the end it never produced the results that were needed. Now, Simon, back to you. Me? Yeah, back to you. What? Your CV is insane. Actor, writer, director, musician. What? I didn't even know about the musician bit either. Like, where's Nor that did come I. from? I don't know where that came from. <laughs> and then, what's your favourite discipline? Um, oh, God. Uh, uh, the, the most voluptuous thing for me is writing. And that's what I, I always wanted to be a writer. Uh, and I've always loved words. I've always 
read insatiably. And uh, I was, that was my plan for myself, but I didn't know quite what to write about, you know. Uh, I've written extensively about myself, but even I realized how boring that was. And no, so, surely not. Yeah, no, I can <laughs> uh, You want to see it. <laughs> uh, but uh, when I started acting, I found I had a subject. I could write about that. It was fascinating to me. I, I came to acting a little bit later than some people do. I was about 23 when I, I was. Acting. I was going to ask you about that, though, because you did come to the fore a little bit later. Do you have any um, words of wisdom, maybe, for someone who's trying to, you know, maybe think you know, it's not going to happen to them? Well, um, you, you know, um, uh, there, there's a right time and a wrong time to do anything, and some people uh, uh, are better off coming to acting later. And it's very honourable. There are lots of very, very famous actors who started acting professionally when they were in their 30s or even later. Some you know, great actors like Margaret Rutherford and uh, Irene Handel came to it quite late. Um, there's no rules about anything. It's doing what you love, really, isn't it, then, I suppose? It, 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 it's really actually doing what you need to do. Uh, loving it is great, but it's not enough. You ha acting is a very tough job. Uh, it's a tough, tough life. It's a life made up of rejection and disappointment. Oh, I know about that, my friend. <laughs> Dumped just two weeks ago. Oh, no. Yeah, I, I know, I know. Not you. I know. We'll talk about it later. Thank you. But, you know, <laughs> this is not about me, okay? This is about you. And you are getting a lot of love on the socials, just to let you know, Simon. Uh, we've got Joe from Sheffield here on Twitter uh, asking, what has been your favorite movie role you've played in your career so far? Well, I think <laughs> uh, it, it, it was uh, um, in a movie that was not tremendously admired. It was called The Chemical Wedding. And I played a man who had been possessed by the spirit of the occultist Alistair Crowley, the, the beast, the, uh, the, 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 the magician. Um, uh, who was um, very uh, despised in his lifetime. Um, and it was a fantastic part. And it was written by Bruce Dickinson of Iron Maiden. <laughs> no, it really? <laughs> and uh, I had high hopes of it, but it was not liked. Um, uh, but I loved doing that. It was a very immensely uh, b b b bold and uh, outrageous kind of a character. But actually, possibly the character that I've loved playing most of all uh, was in um, A Room with a View, which was only the second film that I did. The Reverend Beeb in that film was su such a generous figure. I, I, I wanted to... It was great to be asked to play a character who was benevolent, who was really good at heart. And that was a great joy. And also, it was a great joy to work with my... who then became my... Constant Associates, Merchant Ivory Productions, were just wonderful. And I, I made many films for them as an actor, and I directed a film for them. So they were, it was part of a family uh, uh, atmosphere, which was wonderful. And I bitterly regret. Simon, I keep getting lost in your voice, man. <laughs> Every time you speak, I literally, <laughs> I, just, I just don't even think. I just, you like send me away. It's amazing. <laughs> we're talking about like social media and how much love you're getting and things like that. Look. Uh, I, it sounds, it's sometimes accused of being a vacuous space, okay, social media. And, and you know, I've uh, done quite a few vacuous posts myself. I'm sure if anyone follows me, they will know. And if anyone can add a little bit of gravitas, okay, yes. to some of the posts, it would be you. Yeah. So do you mind, just, for, oh my Lord, if do you mind reading, out, this is my producer's idea, by the way, it was not of mine. Of course, of course. And yeah. uh, do you, would you mind just reading out in your lovely voice? Yes. My awful, awful writing. Yes, I, 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 I've, I've, got, I've got the uh, script here. Oh, he's got it. I've been working How on it. How did you print that out? <laughs> I've worked on it very seriously <laughs> all night. This is why I'm looking so drained at the moment. Okay. It is draining as well. Here we go. This is the first of these marvellous blogs. Um... We all know the drill when you're alone in a pool abroad. <laughs> Taken me a while to get to the point where I feel body confident to do a photo like this. It may look a little lame, ha ha. <laughs> but I like to see it as a reminder to myself that 
Hard work pays off. I feel awesome at the moment. <laughs> this is just the beginning. Thanks for following my journey. Hope everyone's had a great day. Oh. Now, the second blog concerns a sport that I know nothing of, football. And what is that first word? It's called Mane. 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 Mane crumbled. <laughs> I hate Liverpool FC as a Chelsea man. But God, do I respect them on nights like these. Makes me fall back in love with football. <laughs> oh. I've got another one. Oh, there's another one, I'm afraid. With, with pick there. Oh, no! It's just got to stop. Yes. <laughs> I've been told gold isn't my colour. But as I slipped into my date night gown, I realised that who cares about what people think? We're all on our own paths. Gold is now my favourite colour. <laughs> Only have my left ear pierced. Couldn't go through the pain of piercing the other for the gram. That's lovely. That, that was possibly the best thing that's happened to me all year. <laughs> Thank you so, so much, Simon. It's been such a pleasure having you on the sofa. It's been fun. I'm so sorry. That is all we have time for. Please put your hands together one last time for Simon Callow, CBE. Now, I highly recommend going to watch A Christmas Carol. I most certainly will. Thank you so much for watching. I've been Sam Thompson. Have a lovely day.